let me start by first thanking Ishan very much for inviting me uh, to give these uh, lectures. Uh, I've already enjoyed coming to India. I'm going to enjoy these lectures and I hope you do uh, too. Uh, I'm very grateful. I'm also pleased that you all came. I've never given a lecture to a zero audience. I don't know how that would work. I don't think I would enjoy that. But what I do enjoy is having interactions with you. So please do interrupt and ask questions and for clarifications or things. I may think it's absolutely clear, but nobody else thinks that, and that's not good. You can <laughs> ask uh, questions. Okay. Well, you see how much I've already learned about uh, India. This is uh, the Indian uh, uh, famous uh, place. And I'm going to tell you about uh, geophysical flows and lots of different uh, geophysical flows or important bits of it. Uh, first, there are volcanic eruptions, and I will tell you something about uh, lava flow and the uh, motion of uh, things uh, like this. Then there are clouds with this wonderful uh, rainbow and uh, I'm going to talk today about convection uh, which is relevant to some of these uh, clouds. Here's an iceberg a photograph I took down in the Antarctic about six or seven uh, years ago and I'll tell you about some things that happen in the oceans near these icebergs and here's bits of the large ocean circulation uh, which I just took from the web, so I don't actually know where these countries are, but that's uh, 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 somewhere. Now, I'd like to start by doing two little experiments uh, for you, which will show you why I'm interested not only in geophysical flows, but in fluid mechanics. My interest in geophysical flows is because we live on the Earth, and that's part of what uh, goes on in the Earth, and it's nice to know. My interest in fluid mechanics is, and with all respect to those who have a different view or had a different view until they hear me, it's much more interesting than solid mechanics. It's the most interesting uh, subject there is. And I'm going to prove this to you with two simple experiments. The first is, I'm going to sit on this table. And what happens? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm heavier than this uh, table. I'm more dense than this table, and the table rattled a bit because it's not a very new table, but otherwise, pfft, boring beyond belief. I'm going to show you the same thing in fluids. Fluid mechanics is much more exciting. This is some water. I'm going to prove to you that there's nothing special about this water. I mix it up. Uh, Boussinesque approximation or not, it's all uh, uh, water. <laughs> Now, I'm going to take some of it into this test container. I'm going to make it a little heavier by adding some sugar. I'm going to open the sugar. I at first thought of opening it first, but then I thought maybe you'd think I was cheating. So, uh, there's no cheating going on. I'm adding some sugar. I'll tell you what, this is a very carefully controlled experiment. We'll, uh, what's so funny? <laughs> we'll add two bits. And to show you how homogeneous it is, there's are different sh sugar particles. They don't know that. I mix them up, and I make a, a fluid that's exactly like in the big container, except it has dissolved sugar. And that means it's heavier. Well, I've almost dissolved as much sugar as I can get into it. Now I'm going to pour a little bit of red ink. That won't do anything to the density. That's a super, super Boussinesque approximation, but it'll make you see the uh, fluid. Now let's put some more. The instruction said three bits, so I'd better do it correctly. Um, it, this is an accurate experiment, no matter how much you guys laugh. <laughs> but it'll be a messy experiment unless I close this properly. So here's this heavy fluid, and I'm going to pour it carefully with a... Shh, the doors are locked. A spoon that I stole from where I'm staying. <laughs> 
because I needed a spoon and I asked Dishon, how do I get one? He said, steal it. Oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. that uh, <laughs> but I'm going to give it back. Now I'm going to pour this heavy fluid on. And you remember what happened when this heavy character, well, not too heavy, but a little more heavy than he should be, uh, character sat on uh, this thing, nothing happened. Now you see, it all quickly went to the bottom, not quite as nicely, I put in too much sugar, and I'll, I'll let you into a secret, I've never done this before, but <laughs> I thought it would be fun to do. But what you see is it really went to the bottom. So there's mixing, just as uh, we heard uh, before, and that's what makes fluid mechanics interesting, and that's why I'm going to tell you about uh, fluid mechanics. Now I'm going to have some uh, chapters uh, and uh, we'll go through the six lectures in these uh, chapters. Um, I'll tell you what, just in case, let me move this because I'd hate it to fall down. Uh, the first chapter will be uh, convection, motion driven by density differences, as was hinted at uh, in the previous nice lecture and I'll talk about some of the same equations. We'll then talk about plumes, plumes which are vertical motion of light fluid. Then we'll talk about gravity currents and their horizontal motion of uh, fluid. So it's plumes if it goes mainly uh, vertical, uh, if it's mainly horizontal it's a gravity current. Then I'll spend some time talking about what's called CCS, carbon capture and storage. Uh, I won't talk about the capture, which is a chemical problem, but I'll talk about the storage and I'll motivate that with talking a little bit about climate change and why, no matter what the politicians and the president of some country says, it's going to cause a lot of... He didn't hear, so I'm fine. Uh, it's going to cause a lot of uh, uh, trouble. Unfortunately, I don't mind that Jim didn't hear, but bloody Trump doesn't hear either. Uh, that's the real problem. Um, so I'll talk about that and the storage will be in porous media, in the earth in porous media. So I'll tell you something about the earth and how it's uh, uh, manufactured in some sense uh, and then I'll tell you quite a bit about uh, flow in uh, porous media. Right. I'm going to start with the Navier-Stokes equations, which we had uh, written up uh, so nicely. Uh, this is really, although it has one, two, three, four, five, six terms here, it's just F equals MA in different languages. Force is mass times acceleration. Here's the force. Well, there's even an F here. There might be some force here, body force, magnetic field or something. Here's the gravity, which uh, was talked about, multiplied uh, by the uh, density. Here's the viscous dissipation term. Viscosity is going to play an important role in uh, some of the things I do, so we've got uh, here. Here's the gradient of the pressure that was up there before. And this is rho capital D U D T, as was written before. In other words, this is the acceleration. The acceleration following the fluid parcel, and that's where the U dot grad comes, as well as the DDT, because we follow the fluid parcel and it's the forces on it that make for uh, motion. Now this is the Navier-Stokes equation. This is Navier. This is Stokes, very famous uh, character. Keith Moffat, uh, my colleague in Cambridge, says often Navier wrote down the left-hand side and Stokes wrote down the right-hand side. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but there's something uh, to that. I don't know much about Navier. He lived a little before my time. But uh, Stokes, who also lived before my time, I don't want you to get the <laughs> idea. Don't get the wrong idea. He was a, an extremely capable uh, and very colourful uh, character and did uh, really a huge amount of work, uh, in particular looking at the effects of viscosity in fluids. He was president of the Royal Society. He was the master of uh, Pembroke. And at one day, he got up in the morning and he walked through the grounds of Pembroke that only had male students and to every man, boy or man really, he wished them a long life and hoped that all would go well. 
And that night he died. Now nobody's totally understood where cause and effect came in, but that uh, was that. Navi I can't tell you much about, and in fact, as you can imagine from his date of birth, there were no photographs of him, uh, there no cameras around, it was just this uh, bust. Now, the Boussinesq approximation, I'm going to go one step further, I'm sorry, you will have recognised from my accent I'm an Australian. As all you Indians know, Australians are A, very competitive, and B, if you don't mind my saying, have a much better cricket team. Um, but <laughs> my competitiveness is I'm going to go one step further. I'm terribly sorry. Australia wins again. And. Sorry? Whether Australia has a better cricket team? No, it's not. <laughs> There's a series going on to happen. Sorry? There's a cricket series going on to Right now? How much do you want to bet Australia's going to win? <laughs> <laughs> Here's Boussinesq, uh, a uh, French uh, um, fluid dynamicist, and I think his only real contribution was to make the Boussinesq uh, approximation. Now, we've been uh, through this, but I'll just uh, say it uh, again. He's uh, using well, almost the exact notation as was used before. I, there's a star here where uh, before you just had nothing, I think. Yeah, but uh, and uh, but an over bar for the mean uh, value and uh, putting out the hydrostatic contribution of the main density and the variation in pressure with Z, uh, the mean pressure and then the difference uh, depending on x, y and uh, t and the equation that was written up before just here as I recall. Uh, I shouldn't have had that rubbed out, could have proved I was right. Um, we take out the hydrostatic pressure, that's the mean uh, pressure. Uh, so we get to uh, this equation, we've taken out the hydrostatic part of this uh, balance here and now what uh, was said so uh, nicely, this is uh, G rho prime over rho naught, which is generally written as G prime, the reduced gravity, and this is the M1 minus, sorry, M2 minus M1 over M1 plus M2, no, no, no over just M1 uh, multiplied by G. So it's exactly uh, the same. So here's the left-hand side. Uh, because, as was said so nicely last time, we can reduce, uh, sorry, we can neglect the variation in density in looking at the acceleration uh, term, so we can bring it down here, which makes it easier. So this is the variation of u with time following the motion, capital D u dt, 1 on rho naught uh, grad p prime, which has got rid of the hydrostatic pressure. We've uh, put in the g prime, the reduced uh, gravity, that's going to be the important uh, term, and then the viscous term, which is important. And now gravity is going to uh, vary, uh, I don't need this yet, but I will later, I'll just write it down here, uh, in terms of what's called the buoyancy frequency, and I'll define that all in uh, a minute, uh, but it's here on this equation, so we might as well have it. So that's the important Boussinesq approximation, and here is Boussinesq uh, again. Uh, Sorry? I'll, I'll tell you about this, where I got this uh, from. Yeah, later. Um, there's uh, Boussinesq. And now, as I say, I'm going to, the first chapter is going to be convection. Now, there are lots of, well, not lots, there are three, that can be a lot. Uh, somebody who says, well, I've had three wives, that's a lot of wives. Uh, so there are three different forms of uh, heat transfer. One is radiation, as uh, exemplified by a fire. One is conduction, where this hot fluid or hot uh, saucepan is moving heat uh, along this uh, rod by particles, solid particles hitting each other, uh, well I shouldn't say, yes, particles hitting each other and that's by conduction bringing heat into the hand. But what we're going to talk about and is much more important than uh, in geophysical situations is convection. Where this fire heats up the uh, lower layer here and 
that gets less dense. It's just pure water, just like the water over there, but not with any ink in it, because they're going to drink this or make tea of it. Um, so it uh, heats it up, makes it less dense, and that makes it rise to the top. If it rises to the top in a form that we'll see in a moment, by continuity, div u equals zero, there has to be some fluid that goes down. That's relatively cold fluid because it's in uh, um, time, uh, it's in contact with the air, and so we get relatively cold fluid descending, taking the place of the hot fluid that goes up. Now you've all seen this, that's convection, quite turbulent convection. How long do you think it would take for this saucepan to boil? I, I, you know, one significant figure will do, I don't need to know. No one has ever boiled a saucepan? Four You've never boiled it, sorry? Four minutes. Four minutes, right. To one significant figure, absolutely dead on. Now, there's another way that we could boil this uh, saucepan. What we could do is we could heat up the lower fluid here and it could conduct without moving. Imagine I didn't have uh, water but something that really very sticky oil. We could, we'll suppress convection for this story. It could move water up by conduction, which we talked about here, and then uh, gradually there'd be a temperature gradient between, let's say, zero, whatever is in the uh, uh, air, to a greater and greater heat. And eventually, that temperature would get more and more, and you'd boil the water by conduction. To one significant figure, how long would that take? We've got four minutes for convection. Well, let me just say, if you can do better than four minutes, then we're going to have to think of a way to restrict this fluid to transfer heat by conduction. So we can make it very sticky. It won't taste very good. But if you think it's going to take longer, bad luck. Well, what do you think? One hour. Sorry? One hour. One hour. Do I have an advance on an hour? One hour. Going to this gentleman up here for one hour? <laughs> three hours. Three hours. Any advance on three hours? Look, this is a valuable piece. Uh, I want some real input here. What, sorry? Oh, I know. Could that be right? <laughs> two days. It would take two days by conduction, four minutes uh, by convection. So clearly convection is much more important in some sense. It transfers stuff much more rapidly. And we're going to talk in part about uh, that. Here's some examples of uh, heat transfer and convection in uh, the uh, atmosphere. You have the sun coming down on uh, clouds. You have fluid uh, motion. It might be in the uh, shadow of the cloud. And so this little bit of air gets uh, colder and hence heavier and it uh, sinks. Then there are bits of the sun that uh, shine on uh, the uh, Earth's surface and that reflects it, you know, a lot of black roads. Uh, that is great at uh, reflecting air, uh, reflecting uh, heat, and so that heats just like uh, the uh, saucepan, uh, but it goes up by convection. So that's really a very, very simple diagram of showing you how convection plays an important role in uh, the atmosphere. In the oceans, uh, it also plays an important role. Ice uh, melts, uh, sorry, uh, ice freezes and it, uh, it uh, leaves behind relatively salty uh, water because the salt doesn't get taken into the ice. It forms pretty much pure ice uh, and uh, that uh, makes the salty water come down. It's cold water, because, well cold compared to here because it's uh, near the poles and that sinks and it mixes in part as uh, we uh, saw that this happens to be vertical rather than the horizontal thing doesn't make any difference uh, and uh, that plays an important uh, role and in fact if this is the Antarctic uh, 
Water that comes from the Antarctic has been discovered as far north as about 70 degrees uh, north. So it goes over the equator and makes quite a, a deal. And as was said, of course, the topography plays a uh, um, role. Now, if water sinks like this due to the convection, there has to be warm water that moves uh, that way uh, because of continuity. Uh, and of course, this is not all simple and steady. It's as was said, turbulent, unsteady. It's influenced by the heat input to the ocean. And you know, sometimes the sun shines and sometimes it doesn't shine. It's covered by cloud. You guys don't know much about that, but I live in England. Let me tell you, I know a lot about uh, cloud cover. Uh, and that plays an important role. And then another important role, which isn't on this diagram, is the wind blows. And the wind can blow not at all for a while, or it can blow extremely uh, strongly, and that helps the uh, motion. But convection, transfer of heat, which we're going to talk about, plays an important role. Now, this is uh, the Earth uh, in cross-section. There's a solid inner core, mainly pure iron, to a uh, radius of 1,221 uh, centimetres. Oh, sorry, wow, 1,221 kilometres. <laughs> I was close. <laughs> Just to uh, realise that, I didn't make a big mistake. Uh, there's a story that a uh, scientist was explaining to a politician how they needed to get things going on a certain... Uh, 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 what's the word I want, the storing of drugs. And uh, the politician said, what do you think we need to store? How many do we need? How much will we need? And he said, well, about uh, 10 to the 8th. How much do we have at the moment? Well, we have about 10 to the 4th. Well, said the politician, we're halfway there. <laughs> and that's the politician's understanding of science. Um, anyhow, well, but I, I didn't do much better, did I? <laughs> 1,221 uh, kilometres. Um, it's constantly cooling, and hence it's solidifying. Now, the liquid outer core here uh, is mainly iron, but not entirely, and some nickel and sulphur and lots of other things. But this, uh, the phase diagram, the description of how you go from a liquid out here, a liquid mixture or liquid compound, to the solid, says that it'll mainly put down iron, a little, little bit of uh, nickel, but not much. Uh, and what's left over is less dense. So what's left over goes up and convex round uh, like uh, this. So convection plays a very important uh, role here. In particular, without that convection, there'd be no magnetic field. Without a magnetic field, none of us would be here because we're protected by the magnetic field from uh, uh, radiation from space and lots of things. So this is really very important. It also is a fascinating uh, problem because it's, on a short time scale, quite unsteady. As you know, I've already explained that uh, convection can be unsteady and has already been said in turbulent convection. But for reasons that people don't quite understand, it can also reverse. Instead of going like this, and so this is the North Pole, the whole magnetic field, and the con which is driven by the convection, can reverse and make it, or well, that can now be the South Pole. So the vector goes from pointing like this. Now, how does it go? It could go to pointing 180 degrees in a number of different ways. It could go like this, and there'd be no magnetic field, and we'd be in big trouble because that protects us, and then, well, you understand, <laughs> the same uh, side of it. Or it could go, and so it was always exactly the same strength, but it just moved around. The Earth, being uh, a determined character, does both. And so what happens is that the field reduces, but not completely, as it goes round, and then comes out. Now, that's the last line of a uh, paper, the first line of which has never been written. Nobody knows exactly how this happens and why.
the uh, dynamo, the Earth's dynamo that generates the magnetic field due to convection uh, and uh, interaction uh, with the iron in the liquid outer core uh, plays this role. Please. The also, right? Sorry? The similar thing happens in the 11 years. Y yeah, yeah, there's a sort of similar thing that happens. But of course the sun, well I'm just going to come to the fact that as we know, there's a solid bit here. You can't do that in the sun. <laughs> um, it would, uh, it, it's all, and that plays a big role. Well I'm just about to uh, talk about this uh, in that there's a solid upper mantle but there's convection that takes place in that and all, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, this upper mantle and also a little, there should be a lower mantle here, but the convection that takes place uh, in uh, that and moves the earth at a very, very slow rate. Now I'd like to tell you a story because I, I often enjoy it. On one Saturday morning when I was a graduate student in California, my wife came home and said, your friends, who you're really telling me are so clever, Dan McKenzie and Bob Parker, they were little kids. I saw them outside the post office this Saturday morning. They were little, little kids. And I, unfortunately, I'll be honest with you, shrugged my shoulders and said, I, I don't know why they were laughing like that. What I should have said if I'd had real insight is, they've just finished writing the paper that will start the theory of so-called plate tectonics, that the uh, Earth is on the top made of solid plates that go past each other. They've submitted it to nature. This is what I should have said. They're submitting it to nature. In those days, none of you will understand this. None of you will understand this. You submitted manuscripts in paper form, in, in hard uh, copies. Uh, but let me tell you, that's wh what we old folks used to do. Um, and they went to the... P Thank you. They went to, to uh, the, uh, the post office and they were told it was $3 or something to send their manuscript to nature. But, said the man in the post office, I'm afraid we've run out of all stamps except one cent stamps. So they had to put on... 300 stamps, <laughs> which they licked and uh, <laughs> behaved like uh, complete kids. But I didn't have the insight to know what would happen. Now, Dan McKenzie didn't have the insight to know that this was such an important and valuable letter, as they used to be called in uh, um, nature. Most article, well, sorry, most manuscripts were letters. When it was submitted, the nature uh, editors saw that this was so important that A, they wanted to publish it immediately, and B, as, a, uh, uh, as an article, which was meant to be longer, but this was so important, the length didn't matter. But the, abstract, uh, but the uh, article had an abstract. So the editor wrote the abstract. The first time they saw this uh, paper was when it came out, they weren't, it wasn't refereed, I don't think, typical nature business seemed to be so important, it wasn't uh, refereed. There were no proofs sent to them. So the first time they saw it was when Nature came to uh, the University of California at San Diego. And there was their letter as an abstract, uh, as an article, with an abstract which to this day Dan McKenzie doesn't understand. It was just written by the editor and <laughs> it's total junk. But the rest of the paper is uh, terrific and it all, and it says that due to convection, even this solid ground here is moving and sliding past each other and the earthquakes in Los Angeles and Japan and uh, in lots of uh, places and that happens all over the world. And again, if I may tell you a story, um, I have had, uh, unfortunately, a wonderful mother-in-law who I uh, adored uh, enormously and one day I was sick in Sydney, Australia this was, one day I was sick and uh, just had a flu and the uh, um, house shook and I in my uh, temperature state said, gee uh, mother-in-law, that's an earthquake, I'd say about magnitude 5.6. And she said, don't be stupid, how could you know that? And I thought, I don't, I'm just, <laughs> I'm so... <laughs> Guess what? It was an earthquake in Newcastle once every hundred years or so, there's an earthquake in Australia and guess what the magnitude was? 
5.6. My mother-in-law adored me from that moment on, <laughs> and I never told her the truth. <laughs> Anyhow, so that's more convection in the quotes, uh, a solid uh, earth. Now, let's go back to a simple uh, uh, case, uh, which is the kettle, the uh, usual convection in the kettle, and we've, as we've said, we heat it from below. That makes uh, the fluid at the bottom get hotter. If it's hotter, it's less, less dense, and hence it uh, rises. And this is just a diagram of what it might look like. Uh, we'll see better diagrams later. Uh, and because it rises by continuity and because this is cold, it has to uh, fall down to be heated and then rise and, and then it goes. And it does it in 4.00 minutes, as you've already uh, heard. Uh, he's laughing because he knows it must depend on this height here. <laughs> and that varies. <laughs> okay, so when people were interested in this, the first problem they thought about is what about if we had two horizontal plates separated by a distance d, there's gravity acting down, we've already seen from the last lecture how important gravity is, we'll make this have a higher temperature than that, so the temperature gets uh, transferred, there could be a conduction solution to the equations, dt dt equals kappa del squared t, definitely has a uh, linear variation between here and here, and u is equal to zero, but that's not the only solution. There's another solution, we'll put it another way, u equals zero is unstable. And a possibility, which we'll see is true, is that there are roles that look like this in the simplest two-dimensional case. But I'm just drawing a simple diagram. Now, I don't want to go through the mathematics as nice as it was done last time of this. I just want to tell you the ideas because I don't have the time to write down all the mathematics and I'd make a mistake. This is an outline of the linear stability calculations. So we're just saying, look, it must be true if it's very viscous, whatever that means, that there's just the temperature gradient, the vertical temperature gradient, because the fluid is so resistant to moving that it stays like that. But there must be another solution that allows for movement, for velocities. And we're going to do the calculation, or I'm going to show you how to do the calculation if there's only small motion. I'm not going to do the calculation, I wish I could, no. If I could do the calculation of what it looks like with rapid motions, I wouldn't be giving a talk now, I'd be writing a paper just like Dan McKenzie uh, and uh, publishing it, because we don't really know that, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So we write down the full nonlinear equations, the UDT, which has already been done. We determine the rather simple steady state. It's simple because U is equal to zero, there's no motion, and the uh, temperature profile is just uh, conducting. That's the linear conduction case. Then we expand with the linear perturbation, and that's using the ideas more or less that were shown on this blackboard uh, before. Uh, U is compared to zero, so that's the expansion. The uh, density gradient is expanded from that linear pace. And because we're going to do the linear stability calculation, though we can do nonlinear, there's no doubt about that, but not very, very nonlinear. Uh, but we're just looking at the linear. We're going to take a, a linear perturbation, which means that everything is going to be proportional to some capital W that's a function of Z, the vertical coordinate. And because there are variations in the vertical, both in the uh, uh, gradient and there are boundary conditions, but not in the horizontal, because the horizontal goes on forever, and I'm only looking at the two-dimensional case in, uh, now for the moment. Uh, it must look uh, like e to the i k x, because it's linear and because there's no variation in x in the equation. In the uh, same way, it must look like e to the i, and I put a minus here, st, really because then we've got a travelling wave, but of course I could call it plus s or whatever I wanted. So this is a uh, travelling wave with wave number k and with uh, frequency uh, s and uh, 
um, phase velocity uh, uh, omega over k, s over k, sorry. So that's what we're going to uh, do. We linearize the resulting equation, just as was done before. We get rid of all the difficult nonlinear terms and the boundary conditions to obtain an eigenvalue equation for s as a function of k. Now, k could be anything. It could represent a, a wave that's big. That's the biggest I can make it <laughs> in explanation, not in theory. Uh, and then the smallest I can make it is uh, like this. That's both in theory and in explanation. Um, so we want to know how this frequency, as a sense, uh, depends on the wave number. And there are, there's no reason why S should be real. It's going to have a real part and an imaginary part. It's going to be complex. And if the imaginary part of S is less than zero for any particular K, that's a decaying mode. So that's as if I set up a mode of, let's say, this wavelength, uh, this uh, wavelength, and the uh, corresponding s is less than zero, then the mode will die away. It's going to be viscously dissipated. If the imaginary part of s is equal to zero, then the wave I put in stays forever. It doesn't grow. It doesn't uh, decay. It just sits there. You have to be damn lucky to get it just like that, but it can happen, of course. The most important thing, and we know that it has to be unstable because we know it doesn't take two, three days to uh, boil the kettle. Uh, there has to be imaginary part of S that are greater than zero and that's uh, unstable. So here's a little uh, uh, sketch of this. And, uh, a stable situation is basically where you're at a point, but if you move it a little bit, it comes back to that point. A, uh, an unstable situation when the imaginary part of S is greater than zero is like here. Now, as you know, I can keep the... Well, if I... Look. So that was just on the point of stability. And my knocking it, that was a non-linear knock, uh, sent it uh, down. So it could stay like this. There is the solution of the chalk staying up like, like this. Um, but if I have a slightly different K or knock, it'll, it'll come down. So in the stable cases, the perturbations decay, and they d decay like um, I in the imaginary part of S, uh, uh, T. The system goes back to equilibrium. If it's unstable, then the perturbations will grow, get bigger and bigger until the linear approximation is no longer correct. Once it gets bigger and bigger, uh, nonlinear effects will play a role. Um, so, for example, when I heat the uh, kettle, I assure you it does it in a nonlinear way, but it doesn't get so hot that it jumps up into the air. Uh, so the nonlinear terms get uh, constrained somewhat. So, and the system leaves the equilibrium of just the straight conduction. So this is just really saying the same thing, only in different terms. The stable equilibrium in the flow system converges, and an unstable equilibrium, the flow system uh, diverges. Now that's a general introduction uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, stability calculations. Now this was done by Rayleigh, uh, the famous Lord uh, Rayleigh. Uh, Typical English business, which as an Australian I've never understood. His name was John Strutt, but he became, when he became a lord, a peer, he changed his name to Lord Rayleigh. Uh, the reason being that normally what happens, or what happened in those days, is the king, or sometimes the queen, came to a man, with all respect, and said, Would you like to be a peer? And he would say, Yes. What name will you take as your peerage and they would say something like we talked about Kelvin and the first Lord uh, the, the, no sorry. this guy's grandfather on being told all of this thought look I'm really quite a successful politician politicians normally are named like this and I could still maybe even become prime minister but if I'm a Lord a peer then I sit in the House of Lords and I uh, won't uh, get to be Prime Minister. 
So I'll say no, but that'll mean my whole family forever will be disadvantaged because being a peer, it's, you know, top of the tree. So he said uh, to the king, how about making my wife the peeress? She'll be the f first Lord Rayleigh's wife, uh, Lady Rayleigh. I won't take the uh, title. And there was a second Lord Rayleigh and now a, a third Lord Rayleigh. Now you can guess the end of the story. What happened? After he said to the king, you know, I'm, I'm still hoping I might become Prime Minister. This is what he achieved. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It was, it was almost as though a fairy had come down and said, well, you've made such a super decision, you're not going to do anything. So, so, whether he regretted this or not, I don't uh, know. Uh, the third uh, Lord Rayleigh was a famous uh, scientist. He had a son, the fourth Lord Rayleigh, of course. And this uh, Rayleigh uh, discovered uh, argon. Uh, there was some mis- uh, adjustment to some measurements and he said there must be something else here and he discovered argon for which he got the uh, Nobel Prize. His uh, son, the fourth Lord Rayleigh, uh, was also a very famous uh, physicist and I'm told that in society they were really disliked because at big society functions, especially the boring ones which people were unhappy about, these two, he and his son, would sit in the corner and talk physics and mathematics and science and were clearly enjoying this boring event. Nobody else was enjoying it, but those two damn so-and-sos were. And he got into a lot of trouble over that. Uh, Bernard, uh, who uh, heard about uh, Rayleigh, he did an experiment which seemed to vindicate everything that Rayleigh had done theoretically. In actual fact, we now know, but I don't think Bernard knew at all, that his uh, experiments were dominated by surface tension that surface tension played a uh, large role. So uh, they were, you know, a theoretician suggesting something to an experimentalist and they were doing different things. But it's still got the uh, subject uh, going. I might just say there's now a seventh Lord Rayleigh. Uh, I rang up the sixth Lord Rayleigh maybe 20 years ago. Uh, uh, sorry, I should say, uh, Rayleigh was a very, very wealthy man. Uh, he owned huge farms in... Uh, um, in Essex uh, that were mainly had cows and produced milk and there was a, a Rayleigh dairy. Uh, there was foot and mouth disease that came in about 1885 or something like that and caused lots of difficulties. He was short of money so he agreed to be professor in Cambridge. So he was uh, the Cavendish uh, professor. Two years later the disease ended, cows got better, guess what he did? Thank you very much, university, and I'll go back to what I enjoy doing. <laughs> but he, ha he did a lot of experiments uh, at uh, home in his uh, wonderful place, Tarling Place, and so I rang up, uh, maybe 20 years ago, the sixth Lord Rayleigh and said, uh, um, his rooms and everything's still there. And I thought it was fascinating. The sixth Lord Rayleigh said to me, yes, I've left the rooms there, I thought it would be nice for my great-great-grandfather. Why would be, you be interested? Science is boring, he said to me. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a professor in Cambridge. I could see him thinking, oh, God, <laughs> another one of these <laughs> hopeless characters. But it was interesting uh, going there, even though he thought it was boring. Um, OK, now we're going to uh, be a little bit uh, quantitative and see what's uh, involved. Uh, we have a uh, density that looks like this. If there's a horizontal temperature uh, difference, uh, then it's going to get, sorry, a vertical temperature uh, uh, difference, then it's going to have a density that looks uh, like this. The hotter fluid is, uh, um, sorry, the hotter fluid is below, it's uh, uh, less, come on, less dense uh, than up above. And if there's a linear temperature gradient, the simplest solution with no velocity, there's going to be a, a linear uh, density gradient. And it's linear, so we'll write it as rho naught, some reference density, one gram per cc, to show my age, what is it, thousand, whatever, other units. Uh, <laughs> one plus some gradient, uh, beta, and this is now uh, z. Now what we're going to do is we're going to write, no, sorry, I should also say, I, as I've already indicated, I'm not going to do many 
calculations, explicit calculations, because you can see that in books, and I think there's nothing more boring. And I've noticed hardly any of you are taking notes, so uh, there's no point in my writing equations on the board. And you can look at it in books, it's all uh, there. Um, but what I will do, or try to do, is to explain the physics, what goes on, what are the physical uh, aspects. And that, in my opinion, is much more important than the uh, mathematics. As a side, I, I might just say, sorry that I'm telling you all these uh, stories, but um, I've got seven hours of lectures. <laughs> um, uh, George Batchelor, the famous man who I'm sure you've seen his book uh, uh, on fluid dynamics and who set up the uh, department in Cambridge and I thought was uh, terrific, was once described in a Scientific American article as a physicist. And somebody came to him and said, George, you must be really upset being described as a physicist. He said, no, 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 much more complimentary than a mathematician. <laughs> and quite right he was. You want to understand the physics of it, I believe. So what's the potential energy by lifting it up here? It's going to be the change in density times some indication of the volume, that's uh, L cubed. So that's the uh, M, if you like, the change in density times L cubed, or the delta M, I should say, times GH. Potential is uh, M, uh, GH. Uh, now, what's the change in density between here and here? Well, if this is height H, and it goes 1 plus uh, B to Z, then you can put uh, in delta rho is going to be rho naught times beta times uh, H from uh, here, uh, and just collecting the terms that says it goes like uh, this. Now, the parcel runs out of buoyancy in the only time scale there is in the problem. You've got L squared, kappa the uh, thermal diffusivity. That's the only time scale there can be because there ain't nothing else. Uh, the viscous uh, dissipation, uh, you get uh, just by, if you like, looking at uh, the uh, formula. It's proportional to uh, the coefficient of viscosity, the velocity, which we'll get to in a minute. This uh, length scale, because that's the uh, length scale, times L squared times H, and that gives you this. That's the dissipation. Now, if the potential energy is greater than the dissipation, then it's going to keep on going. Uh, if it's less, well, then the viscous dissipation cuts it out. So, writing down, and I'm just scaling, I'm not solving any equations here, this uh, potential energy should be larger than the dissipation, so it can go up. We get that this relationship is greater than this. And then when we put this uh, into a form, we get the Rayleigh number, named after Rayleigh obviously, which is the mean density, the slope of the density line, gravity, and gravity clearly plays a role, times some length scale to the fourth over mu uh, k. This is a non-dimensional number, and it's going to be something like 1. Now, when you do physical uh, explanations like this, 1,000, 3,000, 5 million, something like 1. Um, and it, for reasons I, I don't think I can quite explain, the Rayleigh number that is important here is generally 1,000. It isn't close to 1. A lot of other things it is close uh, to 1. Um, so, if we now make uh, beta the appropriate thing, if we have this between parallel plates, and uh, um, L cubed is the space between the plates, we get that a Rayleigh number is the mean density, the gravity. The density is linearly proportional to the temperature uh, difference, delta T times alpha times L cubed over mu or K. So, that explains why when the Rayleigh number is very small, which can be exemplified by being very viscous, relatively very viscous, it's going to be stable. It's not going to move. We've already said if it's very viscous, it won't do anything. As the Rayleigh number becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, we're going to go from a stable system, which goes back to well, the temperature <laughs> profile. Um, then we'll get to a point where it's just marginally stable, and then when the Rayleigh number is bigger than this 
number, the experimental, let's say Rayleigh number is bigger than some critical value, it'll be unstable and it'll start moving. First, how do you estimate the Sorry? Well, I, uh, d d d again, this is the only time scale that's available. I don't use this, I've just put this uh, line in. But it's the only ti time scale available because clearly what uh, happens is this hot fluid uh, is going to come up here and it looks around and it says, or oh, it does in my nomenclature, it looks around and says, gee, it's cold here and they're going to take my heat away from me by diffusion. So it diffuses uh, heat and when it diffuses uh, heat, what uh, happens is that the temperature here becomes the same as the temperature here. That means the density here becomes the same as the density here and so it can't move on anymore. How long does it take to diffuse that heat? Well, from the temperature equation, we know it's a length squared over kappa. There's only one length really here, which is uh, L for the particle. Uh, okay, so now let's go to this graph first. Here's the Rayleigh number. There's a critical Rayleigh number and less than that critical, and we'll see exactly what it is because we haven't yet said anything about the boundary conditions, how we set up the experiment. If it's less than that, it's, there's just conduction. It's just uh, stable. Then you can calculate the linear stability, and that's what we'd uh, calculate here if I did uh, the mathematics. And what it says is all of this is unstable. From this critical Rayleigh number up, there'll always be some wave number. Uh, I don't know why that's Q here. Well, it should be K in my opinion. Um, uh, uh, K, there'll always be something else that goes on, not the static uh, temperature gradient. Now, in the 1950s, people got very excited about what form this would take when the nonlinear terms came in. And people did a lot of nonlinear uh, convection experiments and theory. That I could give the whole six lectures on that and bore you to death and me. But one possibility is hexagonal rolls where the fluid can either come up the centre and then go down the side or the exact opposite depending upon uh, the, uh, the way that alpha varies with temperature, really a um, complicated little problem. Or it can have a, these are all planned views, or it can just be rolls as I drew in the first uh, diagram, or it can be more complicated. And the calculation showed that the stable rolls would, uh, oh, sorry, the, the rolls would be stable in this region. So for this version of K, for a Rayleigh number greater than the critical value, um, for this region there was a, another form of stability, uh, another form of motion, and then there was this region which was totally uh, um, stable. Now everybody was very excited about that in the 60s and 70s and there are lots of calculations uh, done and the story that I like best is two MIT, oh, I didn't say that, two professors in America uh, hated each other, absolutely hated each other. One was a theoretician, one was an experimentalist. So the experimentalist came to the uh, theoretician and said, look at this convection pattern that I've generated, see if you can explain it. And being a clever mathematician, he of course uh, found some ways of mixing terms and nonlinear and God knows what and approximating here. And he got this same strange pattern. He went to uh, the experimentalist and said, see you little shit, oh, sorry, see you nice guy. Um, uh, I can uh, prove what you uh, got. To which the experimentalist said, that's funny. Let me tell you how I got it. And he took the fluid out of the container and he'd etched on the bottom those weird structures. And so, of course, he'd etched on the bottom that weird structure and that's what uh, caused it. So the theoretician being told what he had to get, he could get it. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of excitement uh, about those. Uh, these days, no one's as uh, interested. Now, let's talk about some specific results. We've talked about the uh, Rayleigh number, coefficient expansion, gravity, temperature difference between the plates, 
spacing between the plates uh, Q, thermal diffusivity, because it can run out of uh, heat, uh, and uh, um, kinematic uh, viscosity, and I've explained how beta is the slope uh, of uh, the line. Now, you could have stress-free boundary conditions here, and Rayleigh knew that when he wrote down the equation, if you had stress-free boundary conditions, a little difficult to get uh, in reality, but easy to do in the theoretician's mo notebook, you could calculate 27 part of the fourth over four. Uh, all analytic, and in those days, of course, uh, you didn't have computers and things, uh, which you do now. If you have one rigid and one stress-free uh, boundary, so you could have a rigid boundary, and this could be open to the atmosphere, then the critical Rayleigh number is 1101. If there are two rigid boundaries, uh, the critical number is 1708. And you have to work that out uh, uh, numerically, basically, which they're able to do when they found ways of approximately doing that as well. Now, what about uh, the uh, heat uh, um, flux? Well, the f heat, heat flux has to be related to the temperature difference and the Rayleigh number in this non-dimensional form. Um, and uh, if you have a fixed heat flux rather than a fixed temperature difference, then the critical Rayleigh number for stress-free boundaries is 120 and for rigid boundaries at 720. And as I say, that's order one, even though <laughs> a thousand is not uh, um, really order one. But that's all the linear theory. Uh, now, the question is, of course, what happens non-linearly? We'll just show roles here because it's easy to uh, show. Uh, and it can happen that you can have two-dimensional roles like that, as I showed you. And the way to measure the flux, the average heat flux, how much heat flux gets taken, is to normalize it by the conducted heat flux. So if there's just conduction, uh, then the total heat flux and the conduction heat flux must be the same, so the Nusselt number is uh, 1. It doesn't take much imagination, and you can prove it, that the Nusselt number can never get less than 1. The convected flux, the, the total heat flux, because it's convection plus conduction, uh, physically it's obviously, mathematically not that obvious, um, but it's true, uh, is always uh, greater than uh, uh, 1. And this total heat flux is made up of uh, two properties. First is the heat flux convected or advected along, and that's the mean of uh, the vertical velocity and the uh, temperature. And then there's also a conductive flux, and those two go like this. Uh, and then that's the total heat flux then, the eddy flux and the mean gradient flux. Or, um, and the conducted heat flux is K delta T over uh, H, uh, and so that's the Nusselt number. Now the question, of course, is how does the Nusselt... Oh, here's... Now, this is actually a uh, movie, but somehow or other it won't show. And, uh, I saw this morning. But I hope you have the imagination to see this is being heated from below. Fluids coming up here, not as smoothly and steadily as the linear theory says, but not bad coming here, losing heat to uh, the uh, top and then getting cold and hence going around. And there's more or less a convection uh, role here. Previous, in the previous Sorry? In the previous slide, uh, why isn't the second term in the numerator same as the bottom Sorry, why is the? Second term in the numerator. The conducted heat flux. Oh, be, because the, the, oh, it is exactly the same. This is K times dt dz, but in the conduction case where it's just uh, straight, I hope you might can see that, dt dz is delta t over h. So it is exactly the same. So that's what it uh, looks like. But of course, uh, once it gets bigger, it gets three-dimensional and complicated, uh, as we see in the atmosphere and the oceans. Now, let's look at what happens as the Rayleigh number gets higher and higher. We've talked about what happens when it's zero, nothing, up till the critical Rayleigh number. It's just conduction, 
So it takes four days to heat the cattle if your viscosity is so low, uh, and uh, then it starts to move. But what happens if the Rayleigh number is large, and that's what happens clearly when you boil a kettle. It doesn't boil at a Rayleigh number of 1,000. What you observe is you have a relatively laminar boundary layer. You have to have a boundary layer because you can't have fluid move on the bottom or on the uh, top. It's laminar because you're bringing the velocity uh, down. There's a turbulent and hence well-mixed interior. So the mean temperature, of course, it varies a lot with time and with the uh, position, but rapidly in time and rapidly in position, it looks a little bit like this. The mean is going to look uh, like uh, that. We've already defined the Nusselt number as the heat flux, the total heat flux over the uh, non-dimensionalizing conductive uh, heat flux. And what we want to know is how does the uh, Nusselt number depend on the uh, Rayleigh number? Now, an argument is that, look, this is independent of the size between the plates because this region doesn't see the plates. as It's just a thin boundary layer. And hence, this uh, relationship between the Nusselt number and the Rayleigh number has to be independent of the H because if I double H, the same flux uh, will go through. So uh, then by dimension, well, we've already written down the dimensions of the Rayleigh number we uh, get that it must go like h cubed to the one-third. So you get the famous uh, law that the Nusselt number for high Rayleigh number goes like the Rayleigh number to the one-third, or the heat flux goes like the temperature difference to the four-thirds. Now I say this softly because I don't believe it, but it's true. In the last 15 years, people have spent an enormous amount of time, and I'm going to say wasted effort, finding out whether this is four-thirds or not. Uh, if it's four-thirds, it's 1.333. People have given talks uh, in front of me going to sleep saying, no, no, they measured 1.25 or they measured 1.37 or uh, and they've got, uh, and, and you can get logs in there, you can get absolutely everything. Uh, who cares? Uh, this is only, in some sense, a useful approximation. And whether it boils in four days or 3.9 days, I don't think makes uh, any uh, difference. I uh, had a uh, seminar, I listened to a seminar by one of the most uh, uh, influential and important men in this uh, field. A lot of these stories, I'm not going to mention names for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, uh, last uh, summer, and I said to him at uh, the end, in front of a group about as large as this, I was in the audience, you know, that's interesting, your, your um, theories, and uh, he also used other people's experimental measurements and they differs. What's the influence if instead of being two horizontal plates, they're at a bit of an angle? I'm sure that if they're at a, quite a big angle, then it makes a big difference because it's very easy. You and it goes along like that. So I said, you know, all of this may depend very much on exactly how flat the experimental plates are. And he said, my God, I never thought of that. <laughs> and I was fascinated. Nobody in the audience, and there were some pretty clever cookies in the audience, had the slightest idea. So I said, look, we're doing experiments, or he's doing experiments, others are doing experiments, not him so much, at uh, Rayleigh numbers of 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 14th, really high Rayleigh numbers. Let's just say that this analysis is worthwhile as long as it doesn't slope too much, and the amount of slope must depend on the Rayleigh number. Let's just guess it goes like the Rayleigh number to the third or the Rayleigh number to the quarter. I don't know exactly what it would be. Well, I don't know. It might not go just like the Rayleigh number. Well, if the Rayleigh number is 10 to the 12th, the Rayleigh number to the quarter is 10 cubed. So that says the slope has to be less than 1 in 10 cubed. Boy, it's a pretty bloody good experimentalist who can uh, measure uh, that. So all these different experimental parameters and things, in my opinion, now some people would shoot me for this, but in my opinion, uh, due to the experimental uh, situations, and also, surprise, surprise, in most experiments that I know of anyhow, you have to have a wall here. And what effect do those walls have? Because you can't let the fluid <laughs> fly out.
Rainy Numbers the Third is good enough. Now, uh, Lou Howard, a wonderful, wonderful guy and a really imaginative uh, mathematician, uh, really uh, made uh, this much more rigorous uh, by saying, look, the conductive boundary layer, I know how to solve the conduction equations, that's just uh, del squared t uh, and is, is uh, dt dt, uh, sorry, kappa del squared t is dt. So I find it's got to fit out here, I know what the temperature in the middle is, I get a, a uh, error function and the scale over which this uh, um, boundary layer must go like uh, root pi uh, kappa t. This will happen un uh, growing up until it becomes unstable and then it reduces to zero and then it grows up again. That's uh, Howard's idea. Uh, so that gives you a relationship for uh, the time and there again by analysis and or simplified analysis, Lou gets that the Nusselt number goes like the Rayleigh number to the one third and can even calculate using this idea uh, of what the constant is. And in my opinion, that's sufficient. On the one hand, you say it's independent of H, hence uh, the Nusselt number must go like Rayleigh number to the third, or you make calculations uh, for this process using the conductive uh, layer, and you find it goes like Rayleigh number to the third. <coughs> Finished, in my opinion, but not everybody believes that. Yeah, Sorry? I didn't get the you know, Oh, the idea is that we start with just this horizontal situation, then it heats up uh, by conduction because it's a conductive uh, boundary layer. So it heats up by conduction and that means it uh, heats up with, uh, um, whoops, dt dt is kappa, well, d2 t dz squared, right? with T equal TB, let's call it the bottom temperature. Right? And this uh, grows, here's the bottom temperature, the boundary layer is allowed to grow like the square root of kappa T. So this is the solution for this temperature that starts here and grows with time. Um, it uh, varies with time for how long it uh, goes, uh, then until a time it, uh, it becomes unstable. What's uh, the uh, time? Unstable? Sorry? When you say unstable? Okay. unstable, in other words, it breaks away. So the idea is, if you like, this, no, it's a s simple idea, there's no doubt about it, but I think it follows it. Here, this layer here starts like this. Then as time grows out, it grows up, but then it becomes unstable because locally in this boundary layer, the local Rayleigh number has got greater than the critical. So it becomes unstable and we don't say, ah, just linearly and you have to wait for nonlinear. It just <coughs> blows away in this simple theory and then comes back again. And so it goes like this and then blows away and comes back again and uh, comes back again. I would say no matter what idea you use, because of dimensions, you have to get the Nusselt number goes like Rayleigh number to the third. Um, and that's what you see uh, here. Uh, the only advantage is you can possibly calculate uh, what the constant is. But uh, one thing in which you'll hear me say again and again, dimensional analysis is an enormously powerful and constricting tool. You can get lots of results by dimensional analysis uh, and uh, that gives you a lot of insight. And I might just tell you two uh, stories <laughs> which I think about. My son, who was an <coughs> engineering undergraduate in Cambridge, would come often to me and say, would you help me with some of the mathematics? And, so, uh, help me. and in his uh, third year, he came to me once and said, Daddy, uh, could you help me again? I said, of course. He said, but don't use dimensional analysis. I'm sick to death of it. You use it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, that was, uh, I guess, about know, 15 years ago, and just two weeks ago or so, I uh, happened to, for various reasons, uh, get into contact with the science editor of the Times, the big newspaper in London, 
And uh, I said, look, you may not know who I am, but... Uh, and he said, no, 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 I was an undergraduate. I remember you well. I was an undergraduate in mathematics uh, 20 years ago. You talked about dimensional analysis all the time, <laughs> proving at least he did know who I was. <laughs> but I would say uh, that's the same to you. Any sensible calculation, and this calculation is to say, look, it goes like that and then goes away, gets you that. Sorry? Well, well uh, uh, we, we did the time uh, before, remember, the, uh, when we said, what's the time scale? I mean, th that's the point in all these, there aren't, there's only one time scale. You can't, s because there's not enough around, and you'll see how I'll do something <laughs> two or three lectures later. Uh, you, c you can be out by factors of two, three thousand maybe even, but you can't be out because that's uh, dimensional analysis. This is now just showing you the core, which I've talked about uh, before. There's convection in uh, the core. It's convection, strong Rayleigh number convection. The Rayleigh number here is 10 to the 8th, 10 to the 9th, or something uh, like this. Uh, it's, as I said, uh, losing heat. Uh, the solidifying uh, inner core is growing. It's been around for something like two, uh, no, 1.8 uh, billion years, uh, 1.8 billion years before that there wasn't uh, an inner core, it hadn't uh, solidified yet, and it uh, mixes it uh, uh, up. And then there's the mantle which also does uh, uh, convection, but on a much, 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 much slower time scale. And there's an effective viscosity. And this I've just uh, put in showing you the, the various regions uh, in the inner core. And one thing which I find fascinating this is the center of the Earth. What do you think the temperature is at the center of the Earth? <coughs> and, and four days won't do. <laughs> What's the temperature at the center of the Earth? No one has an idea. Come on, have a guess. 1,000 degrees centigrade, okay? Any ad advance on 1,000 degrees? The man here has the prize at the moment? 4,000. Any advance on 4,000? 4,500. <laughs> <laughs> what a courageous man you are. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you, 6,000, right? Bloody hot. Now, what do you mean 6,000? Is it 6,000.0000? No. Must be 6,000 plus or minus. Plus or minus how much? This is, the, in some sense, the most important value in the Earth, the temperature at the centre. 6,000, what's the error bar? Plus or minus? Sorry? 500. 500. 500? Well, it's 1,000. 6,000 plus or minus 1,000. I find it fascinating that one of the most important temperatures, in a sense, has such an enormous error bar. I occasionally say to students who I can't stand, um, no, sorry, th th that's an ambiguous statement, to those students who I don't like, why don't you go to the centre of the Earth and measure the temperature? There's a PhD right there. No one's yet taken it on. Whoops, taken me on. Uh, pity about that. Um, now, we could also have... Uh, um, vertical convection uh, in the sense that we have a vertical wall and we heat it up and then of course the uh, temperature uh, gets hotter here and it's going to uh, rise so this is just if I take my water here and imagine I put my hand here imagine this was wine I want to warm it up uh, first I put my hand it's a little bit warmer that uh, makes uh, convection and warms the uh, wine up uh, in the simplest laminar theory, you've got a velocity profile that has to look like this because it has to be zero here, it has to be zero far from uh, the wall. Uh, it's got to go upwards because it's uh, so, you know, it wouldn't take much imagination to draw that and you can actually calculate that as well. The temperature profile looks uh, like that. But this is really a laminar boundary layer that I've drawn here. What really happens, and we'll hear much more about that in two or three uh, later lectures, is that this is turbulent. 
Now another example of uh, that uh, is to say what happens if we have ice that's melting and it's in a stratified medium. And the reason that uh, I became interested in this as I went on a sabbatical to uh, Canberra and there was a paper in Nature saying that they could tow icebergs um, to uh, Saudi Arabia, that Saudi Arabia had the money to pay for Antarctic icebergs uh, and there wouldn't be much melting. I can't remember the details of uh, the uh, paper but I remember saying to Stuart Turner who I was visiting a wonderful uh, experimentalist, I don't believe that this is an absolute garbage and he said yeah I don't believe it either, what will happen is so and so, A. And I said no, no, I think that's not what will happen, it'll be B. So we argued for two or three days and then finally one of us said look let's do an experiment and see uh, what happens. It took us about two weeks to get the experimental rig up and uh, the uh, ice and everything and one of those two happened. And after about a quarter of an hour, when it was clear what was the thing, I said, in all honesty, <laughs> Stuart, I'm terribly embarrassed. I can't remember whether I believed A or B. <laughs> Which of the two? And Stuart said, I don't know either. <laughs> I can't remember what I thought. So we knew one of us was wrong and one of us was right, but we never knew uh, which. Um, but this is what happens. Um, quite different. This is now ice, cold ice that's melting. It's ice that's got some fluorescein dye in it, a green coloured dye, so that we can see what uh, happens. And it's in, like in the uh, um, Antarctic, salt stratified water. It's much, much saltier at the bottom, as I explained uh, right at the beginning. So this is in stratified uh, water. The ice melts. It goes up as a boundary layer because it's uh, less dense, but it can't go too much uh, further because it takes salt that here that's relatively heavy up to here and then uh, because there's a salinity gradient, the low temperature but high salinity wins out and it intrudes into uh, the uh, medium. And we can calculate what the height of uh, these uh, must be, but I'm just doing exactly what I've said. How, how much temperature must be uh, uh, extra from the difference between the melting temperature here and the temperature out here, uh, and the salinity gradient gives you that height, and that works very well. Here's a, oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Here's a, another one, uh, another uh, photograph of uh, an experiment where we put some purple dye at the bottom here because we wanted to prove that uh, the fluid that started here ended here. It didn't go up and go all the way. So this layer here has just come from meltwater in this region. There's no movement across these uh, layers. So, what did we do? Published why, it in. Well, the point. Uh, uh, well, the point is that the the uh, a parcel comes off here, and it can come up, and it can only come up a certain distance because its density then becomes equal to the density out here. So it's only possible for movement, if you like, between this layer. And it may be that which Stuart and I argued about, because I now can't remember what the incorrect uh, uh, thing was. But it can only go up... The, the thickness of the layer? Yeah, and that's what we, you get, the thickness of the layer. Um, what was it? Oh yeah, and so we uh, submitted that to Nature and it was a front cover uh, photograph. And then I found out about six months later that the consultancy company who'd uh, done the work and been paid for quite handsomely by uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, said to the scientist uh, advisor in Saudi Arabia, look, we've thought about it and we have another idea. We think it might be slightly different to what we said to you. Would you like to pay us another, I don't know, N pounds or N dollars or N whatever, what is it, a rand or whatever, and we'll give you the right idea. So we lost out on many thousands of uh, dollars, uh, uh, a pity. The idea was to bring ice from the South Poles because uh, Saudi Arabia is short of money and the argument made by this consultancy company 
was that ice was apparently towed uh, to Argentina, uh, Argentina, Argentina or Chile, definitely South America, and I think it was <coughs> Argentina, um, in the 1880s, 1890s. Um, and uh, they have, well, I guess, uh, so they thought they might be able to do it, but to s take it all to Saudi Arabia is ridiculous because it would melt. Sure. Right? Oh, oh, no, no. well in some sense it doesn't show whether you're going to be able to tow it all the way to Saudi Arabia, but what it did say is the melting that takes place, what form it would uh, melt uh, at. It also calculated the rate of uh, melting and what this uh, did, and that's, I believe, I mean I only know by his say in a sense, what the consultancy company told them. Um, what I will say is I went down to the Antarctic five or six years ago uh, and I saw this uh, iceberg and I thought, ah, what a wonderful place to uh, make measurements. And I said to the captain, can we please go as close to the iceberg as possible? And uh, he uh, um <coughs> and I had gone on very well, but that was too much for him. He said, no, 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 it's, it's rather dangerous. The ice can, uh, can suddenly uh, break off. So we got some partial readings, but there have been really good readings made by others in which uh, they see these uh, uh, layers and they fit very well with our theoretical uh, calculation. Okay, so the take-home uh, messages is that uh, light fluid almost always arises, and that's what you saw in this experiment. Over there you saw heavy fluid going down, but it's exactly the same thing. I hope I've shown you that convection can take uh, numerous uh, styles. It's great importance in uh, households, otherwise we wouldn't have uh, tea. Uh, buildings, very important. How, how do we uh, best uh, ventilate uh, this building? What's the influence of uh, these uh, structures? How can we do it as inexpensively as possible? The atmosphere does what it wants, but we'd like to know about that. The oceans, we've already said, uh, the uh, solid uh, earth. Uh, there's still quite a bit of research uh, to be done here, and that I'm sure will be done soon in the future. Thank you very much.